Good morning, everybody. It is Tuesday, September 19th, day 573 of Russia's three-day special military operation. <clears throat> this is the Spartan speaking. Um, might be a shorter stream today. Uh, we'll see how we'll see how long everything takes, but uh, I don't think I have a ton of um, a ton of deep dive rabbit hole content to go over. Um, I did want to, uh, first of all, talk about briefly cover off as we always do yesterday's Russian military losses over the last 24 hours. Um, I wanted to kind of dispel a rumor, um, about Russia's Black Sea fleet. And then we'll, uh, talk about, uh, <clears throat> a little bit about Armenia and Azerbaijan and, uh, and then some some other updates from the Ukraine Russian war. Um, and that'll be, that'll be it. Um, first of all, if you're listening to this right now, even for two seconds, do me a favor, subscribe, like the video. Um, it's very, very helpful. I'm getting a lot more views. Um, the, some of the duration of the views are longer. It seems like people are enjoying the content more. Um, it's still very difficult to beat the algorithm without likes and especially subscribes. <clears throat> so if you wouldn't mind uh, subscribing, that would be great. Even if you despise me, try subscribing so you can just watch me and rage at me. <laughs> Anyways, um, so we'll start off with going over the twenty the losses for Russia over the last 24 hours. 520 uh, troops no longer taking part in the SMO. Seems about average five tanks um it's you know it's it is what it is five the tanks have, have ranged from zero to to 14 uh, recently um it seems to be when the russians are um, are attacking seriously in certain areas um that aren't static front lines for example there's potential for bringing in a lot of more troops or they're moving from one area to the other to reinforce that sort of thing. You tend to see an uptick in some of the armor, especially the IFVs. But um, the, I also think that the Russians are realizing that they're running out of tanks, especially their T-90s and T-80s. And I think they're husbanding them and, uh, and saving them for a rainy day, making sure they keep them out of, out of uh, sight, out of mind, out of artillery range when possible. Along the same line, 17 APVs, that typically tells me that there's not a lot of troop movements going on with the Russians. If they're trying to hide their APVs, they're not moving forward and they're maybe not evacuating a ton, exposing these APVs. 35 artillery systems, that's large. Um, <clears throat> we know the Russians are getting decimated on the artillery side of things daily. Just um, you lose track of the amount of artillery system videos that we see and that's not even all of them but there's just so many of them two mlrs were taken out one anti-aircraft warfare system i'm not sure which i think a toss was hit at some point i'm not sure if that counted and i also know that they they came across um some destroyed s400 launchers so i don't know if that was also included it's really hard to tell um that the timing doesn't always work with this report 15 drones were um, destroyed by the Ukrainians. Uh, didn't check on the the percentage of how many how many uh, sh launched against Ukraine versus what they took out. Um, but I do know that seventeen crystal crystal wow seventeen cruise missile barrage was more like from thirty six hours ago. I think I'm gonna throw the timing off with nighttime in Ukraine. But um, the Ukrainians did come out and say that they had. Um, a hundred percent kill rate on 17 for 17 on the cruise missiles. So that all matches up here are your totals. We are creeping towards 86 or $87 billion in USD in, um, in Russian losses. And of course, based on the value of the ruble versus the USD, that is, what is that? Is that 8.6 trillion? Oh, I forget. I'm not going to do that math, but anyways, I think that might be 8.6 trillion rubles. <laughs> it's just, just crazy. Um, cause the rubles now worth, uh, it takes a hundred rubles to buy a dollar us dollar. Um, so, uh, 
if you haven't already, you may see um, some rumors or what stated as fact that the Sergei Kotov um, was uh, has been sunk in the Black Sea, and that the Ukrainian military intelligence has stated that. It's not actually what the what the translation of what they stated was. It's only been put out in Ukrainian, as far as I know. And the um, uh, defi- uh, definition, the translation, um, is that the prop- and this doesn't work out perfectly, but the propeller is damaged. There is a hole on the port side, fifty by hundred c- centimeters above the waterline. So this is the this is the one that we saw on the um, thermal <clears throat> camera from one of the USV drones. It had already been struck right about here this is not a picture of the this is not a picture of a damage this is this is a stock photo right so there's there was a hole here and you could see the heat escaping from the ship through the thermal the other usv was uh, approaching and filming and being shot at from a deck gun and this particular deck gun which i think is a is that a 40 millimeter Anyways, um, this deck gun was firing at another USC, USV to the front of the boat. Um, so what this post is basically saying is that, that the propeller is damaged and there's a hole on the port side. So you have to realize, too, sometimes when things are translated, sometimes they're translated from um, Ukrainian into, let's say, German and then from German into English, um, it can go, it can make the rounds, right? So you, you lose things in translation and sometimes it's just, you know, Ukrainian to English, but it's a, it's a poor translation service as opposed to a person doing it. I'm not saying that's the case here, but this could be trying to indicate that there are two hits, um, one to the starboard side and one aft on the propeller or what this also could mean is the propeller is damaged there's a hole in the port side it could just mean that there's the one hole it hit and flooded the engine compartment and therefore the propeller is not working and the ship is under tow but there is no firm statement and no confirmation um that the sergey kotov uh, has sunk um i i'm fairly certain there has not been a video or pictures yet of the Sergei Kotov under tow and returning to Sevastopol or wherever. Um, I don't think we've seen that yet. I think we've seen the Admiral Makarov and we saw the hovercraft tri- catamaran boat under tow as well. Both of those were under tow, um, two tugs each and the Makarov had smoke, I believe, billowing from it or oil leaking from it or both. But this particular vessel, uh, either it's been snuck in under the cover of darkness with no photos or it's still out at sea under tow. And um, I was debating on doing a video yesterday or maybe today. We'll see. I might do one. But I have a, I have a theory that the Ukrainians do not want to sink these ships. I'll just leave that out there. Damage, yes. Sink, no. You can probably figure out why. Comment if you think, comment on why you think that might be the case or why you might think that I'm completely out in left field. Um, and moving along, uh, so in sort of geo global, geopolit- oh, it's not geopolitical, but global news, but this definitely does have an impact or could have an impact on Ukraine. Um, it appears that a shooting war has uh, started between Armenia and Azerbaijan over the um, semi-independent Nagorno-Korovac region. Um, and as you know, like the main allies used to be Armenia was aligned with Russia and Iran and Azerbaijan was aligned with Turkey. Um, since then, uh, Armenia has been very upset with Russia because their peacekeepers haven't done anything to protect them. They've started to separate from the Russians. They've ratified the Munich Agreement, basically stating that um, they're going to follow the criminal court doctrine. And if um, somebody like Putin was to visit 
um, they would arrest him and turn him over to the ICC, to the International Criminal Court. So that's kind of like a little, in a nutshell, what's going on. But um, so you can listen here. You can see smoke off in the distance. And you can hear definitely small arms fire. And sounds like an air raid siren, maybe. Oh, is that a dr very loud drone? drone? Drone. That sounds like a loud drone now. So this is an electronic warfare system of the Armenian military supposedly being taken out. It looks, just looks like a Scooby-Doo van with antennas all over it, to be honest with you. Uh, okay, and moving on to the next clip. Uh, so here we have some additional footage. Azerbaijan has launched a military operation in, K in Karabakh, which is Nagorno-Karabakh, in order to restore constitutional order, air quote. Um, the Azerbaijan Defense Ministry said that anti-terrorist measures are underway with the use of high-precision weapons to destroy frontline and deep positions and long-term firing points, as well as combat vehicles and military facil facilities of the Armenian Armed Forces. Hançanlı şehir arasında yerleşen Tor Zenişaşet kompleksi mahvedildi. I believe that was supposed to be an anti... aircraft. I think I, I saw previously what the claim was, what system that was taken out, but that's basically Azerbaijan is taking out an Armenian system. Um, yeah, this is it. Uh, footage of, of strikes on supposed positions and equipment of the Armenian military by the Azerbaijani Bayraktar. Yeah, so the Azerbaijanis have a fleet of Bayraktars, and they were the last time these two had a conflict in 2019, 2020, I think it was. Um, they devastated the Armenian military. And yeah, just seeing if anything else was added to it. So here you go. And again, this isn't a direct correlation um, to Ukraine at the moment. However, you have to think that if Russia gets pulled into this, it impacts their ability potentially um, to continue with the operations at the level they are in, in Ukraine. If Turkey is drawn in, Turkey is, you know, uh, supposed to be like a bit of an arbiter of peace, uh, controlling the access to the Black Sea, um, working, you know, buying buying gas and oil off of Russia, at the same time supplying TB2s and other military aid to Ukraine, etc. So if Turkey is drawn in, that could be something, that could mean something to the conflict and or the Black Sea, you know, support, etc., um, Iran has basically stated if anything goes on with Armenia, they're going to join the fight. Turkey then stated that if Iran joins the fight and, and supports Armenia, that Turkey is going to take that very seriously. Um, I also saw a statement that's supposed to be attributed to Armenia's president saying that they won't get into a war over Nagorno-Karabakh, um, yet at the same time, it looks like the Azerbaijanis are potentially using this as an opportunity to strike the Armenian positions. I don't know if they're fighting back or not, but so anyways, lots of moving pieces. No, I don't expect to see um, Armenians or Azerbaijanis fighting in Ukraine, but this conflict could impact a lot of the major players that are supporting one side or the other in Ukraine. And sorry, just real quick. 
Yeah, so this is apparently Armenian footage. No, Azerbaijani footage from the Azerbaijani TV2 showing strikes on Armenian positions. This looks like a trench line to me. It could be a command post there or something with cover on it. Or just a larger trench. And I mean, those, those, those strikes to me look like maybe medium sized mortars. It's very hard to tell the level of detail and coverage is nowhere close to what we're used to in Ukraine. And again, this is sort of single source from the Azerbaijani side of things. So it's, it's their Bayraktar that took this video. So you're going to just get their commentary for now. That could be a fort, a trench fortification there that just took a hit. And another one that so looks like fairly accurate. And that's to me just looks like mortar fire. Small to medium sized mortar. You can see them dropping all over this hill. Looks like whoever's got this hill has got a good trench set up there for viewing in the little valley below. Anyways, that is that. Um, in other news, better news, Latvia has announced the deportation of almost 4,000 citizens of the Russian Federation. They will receive notice of the need to leave the country within three months. Uh, they're going to be so mad. Over the next three months, almost 4,000 Russians living in Latvia will be notified that they need to leave the country. The reason for the authorities' decision was the reluctant, reluctance of the citizens of the aggressor country to confirm knowledge of the state language. Basically, they were saying that you, they don't need to speak Latvian, they don't need to learn it, and it's not in a real language. And most likely, a lot of their attitudes were that this is Russian territory, you're just calling yourself Latvia for the moment. As the representative of the Department of Citizenship and Migration Affairs of the Ministry of Internal Affairs of the Republic, jeez, Maya Rose reported all of this. Her business card's got to be the size of a textbook. Um, Maya Rose uh, reported all the people did not sign up for the Latvian language exam in order to extend their residence permit. So like a lot of countries, if you want to be a permanent resident, you have to, at some point, um, learn the language or be able to be passable in it. Sometimes you have to take a language competency test to, to get citizenship or landed immigrant status. So it sounds like that's what's happening here and the Russians are refusing. Earlier, the official Riga warned that it could expel about 6,000 citizens of the Russian Federation from the country if they did not register and pass an exam on knowledge of the national language. Among the Russian-speaking residents of Latvia, pro protest moods immediately protests immediately erupted, uh, many of whom declared the oppression of their rights and unwillingness to return to Russia. So the rights are being oppressed. They don't want to return to Russia. They want to stay living in Latvia, but they refuse to learn the basics of the language of the country that they want to call home. There you go. Um, as, as the lower text of the thumbnail stated, um, and this is very, very unofficial and early, but um, it appears through Russian um, mill bloggers, uh, some Ukrainian frontline sources, as well as this video that um, Ukrainian forces have entered um, or are still in, because I think they maybe entered at one point, but uh, a portion of the village of Opitny. Um, first of all, where is Old Pitney? It is on the far east side. Let's, actually, I'll zoom out and I'll give you this. Um, so there's a Pitney, right? And we'll zoom in south of Bakhmut. Well, south of Bakhmut. And so you remember just recently. The Ukrainians took this territory here. There is the gray zone here, and the airport is. Oh, uh, this map's not going to show me. I think that's. I think that's the airport right there. But anyways, so uh, the Ukrainians are in the northern third or more of a pitney, 
And um, the reason why you know that they're sort of still there, possibly advancing, and the Russians are possibly retreating, is, as Andrew Perpetua likes to uh, discuss when he's preparing his incredible maps, is that um, you can with almost certainty tell where the Russians are or where they're not based on where they shell. And when they start dropping white phosphorus on a city or town, that typically means that they have vacated that town. The Ukrainians are there and the Russians want to make life hell. And this is geo confirmed to oh, Pitney. It's probably one of the most beautiful, horrendous things in wars, those phosphor shells um, going off at night and landing murder sparkles, as Ronnie Fitt likes to call them. Um, so there you go. So a little bit of uh, more of an advance. Deep State's already got them in the first third. It's hard to tell exactly where they are, uh, if they are advancing, but they are in, for sure in this in the city. And there are rumors that they've got their feet on the edge of the of the airport, um, but that's unconfirmed. Um, heavy explosions reported from the Russian occupied Melitopol. You guys all know where Melitopol is. There's Melitopol right there, right? There's the Black Sea, the waterway that goes in Melitopol. Um, this is basically a massive hub, all southern roads, rail, etc. Um, go through Melitopol because none of these are accessible in the north. Um, so if, for example, you take out the infrastructure there, if the Ukrainians are pushing here, and if they uh, were able to kind of take control of Melitopol, even if they don't have to enter it, but just surround it and cut off these four major access roads and rail lines, the rail hub, the rail line goes all all the way along the south, down to Crimea, across to Kherson, etc. Um, plus, plus the roadways, you can see that nothing would be usable up here. So this is it. If you were able to take this, um, surround it, cut off these four major access roads and rail lines, you basically have strangled everybody to the west, and potentially Crimea, if the uh, Kerch Bridge and the other bridges are unavailable, and the landing ships keep getting taken out to the point where the Russians can't transport anything. Um, so anyways, so let's watch this. Uh, sorry, I didn't finish reading that. Heavy explosions reported from Russian-occupied Melitopol. The smoke plumes are big enough to be seen several kilometers away. Since Melitopol is an indispensable logistics hub, this bodes not well for the Russians. Oh, I thought I could expand this one. Can I? Yeah. This one's not great. You can hear the strike. You can see something in it. Yep. Looks like something being either. Looks like it looks like something was shot in the sky, potentially a drone or something like that. There is the smoke plume off in the distance, like they said, several kilometers away. That's pretty big. Fairly white cloud. If I had to guess, I'd say an ammo depot based on the how clean that cloud is. It's not, you know, black and thick. Like a hydrocarbons being burnt. Okay, and I'll take it back on that one. That's a black, dirty cloud. Something different was hit on that one. So that's at least two, if not three strikes. One, two, and that might be a third one. And there's the... Oh, ho. That looks like one of those munitions. Uh, the, that could be a Vulcan. Uh, that could be the German Vulcan munition. It's pretty far away, though. Or that could just be a you know a drone strike or something like that. But um, up closer to a target, you've seen these Vulcan munitions. Basically, they come in, they um, explode midair. 
direct their payload towards the target and then you see that kind of puff and then the stream afterwards but you know typically really close to their target but that is interesting that that is aimed, aimed exactly at those explosions over there so anybody's got an idea in the chat put it in the chat what you think that munition might be is that a drone strike or was that the actual munition that caused that second explosion I don't know which way I'm leaning. And last. I haven't watched this one. Those are substantial. So you've got some contrails already of something that went by before. There's something over there. Let's listen to that one more time. It's a pretty big explosion. That's substantial. That's not a... You can, you can just almost feel it. Anyway, so something to keep an eye on. Um, could just be, you know, some ba battlefield conditioning or it could be something larger, uh, you know, airfield, ammunition, logistics. We'll see. Um, as far as Ukrainian ingenuity goes, oh, I'm going to have to mute this, unfortunately. Um, so... As you may or may not know, when somebody gets injured on the battlefield, um, and to a lesser extent, when someone needs to transport something to and from the battlefield, but specifically an injured person, um, depending on the distance they're traveling by foot, uh, you see so you've got the injured troop, right? So they're going to be on a litter stretcher. You're at least going to have uh, four guys that's like that's the ideal number well, six might be ideal if you can spare them but four is the minimum that you're going to spare to carry one on each corner and then typically you're going to have at least another person um that's going to be you know could be running point could be looking for mines could be um you know providing cover for them depending on the type of terrain and the type of um uh intensity of fighting that's going around around them um, so one person injured could end up tying up at least in themselves plus five other people if not more to get them from the battlefield from the front line to a, a casualty collection point um, and then to maybe you know that's also the casovac point or maybe you know they're moved again to a casovac that's safe or whatever um, so you can, you can see that, uh, you know, your, your mate gets, gets injured and you want to get him off. He's bleeding and he's got to get somewhere fast or fast ish. Um, and you, so you're going to pull four to five guys out of the trench or whatever, um, and run him back. Well, now all of a sudden there's four to five guys that are no longer covering their line of trench thins out your line. Think about now multiple, like four or five, six, seven guys that are injured and they all got a, you know, shrapnel and they've all got to move back one by one. That could basically decimate a unit's ability to pro provide any offensive capabilities for that day or for hours and could also make them very uh, susceptible to a counterattack because they've lost so many people that are transferring these casualties. So if there's, <clears throat> this is a way for you to basically uh, transport a casualty with maybe one or two supporting uh, troops as opposed to five or six. So just another Ukrainian ingenuity. Oh, I said I was going to mute. And this video is choppy. I don't know if this is me or the video, but so obviously some assembly required. It's got a little bit of a tank track. And the litter expands. You got a good sized guy in here, probably about a 200 pound guy. Lays down on the litter. And this also could be used for food, ammo, special equipment. All right, strap him in. Away it goes. And this guy follows along with the remote control. So. You could be getting this guy going down the road and just the one person manning the litter, maybe two, one manning the litter and one with a, 
a gun providing cover. So anyways, kind of a cool um, invention. Hopefully this gets into mass production, something that's maybe a little quicker to set up, but at the same time, hey, it's great. Once it's set up, it's good to go. It can sit on the side and just wait. Uh, next up, uh, so you may might recall that uh, there was some... Um, this video is crazy, by the way, uh, that there was uh, some controversy, some corruption, etc. that was going on with providing militaries food to frontline soldiers in Ukraine, um, as well as maybe overpaying for things. The quality of the food was poor, whatever. And a couple of people that reported to Reznikov were eventually sacked. And then eventually Reznikov um, was asked to resign. I can guarantee you that you've never seen an MRE like this before in your life. Um, so this is a, basically, this is basically saying food reform in the AFU, basically saying that the uh, MREs may have gotten a little bit better, a little bit fresher. And uh, I can safely say that this is as fresh as they get. You can see this box is taped up, these bags, this is not for, this is not a joke. These bags are all sealed, came from the Ministry of Defense, supplying them with their with their food for the day. This could be what would be considered uh, lunch for lunch for a four man unit. Uh, I'm just guessing. I don't know. MRE number three. So what do we got? Perfect. Two frozen fish. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I assume they're frozen. They didn't really flop around that much. The tails look like they were frozen. I got some uh, energy drinks. So based two drinks, so I'll, I'll say this is a two fish, two drinks. So I'll say this is an MRE meant for two. And then this blows my mind. Prawns, they're alive. They're sitting in that bag. I don't know how. With I didn't think any air. And these fresh prawns show up, and you basically can throw them in and boil them. And there's some like kind of bay leaves looking things for spicing up the meal. So you can basically make your little seafood, freaking whatever, tilapia or tilapia. No, it's not right. That's a type of fish. Anyways, I think it's tilapia. But <laughs> and the guy says, "Let's open more emery, See what we got." That's that. That's crazy to me. I've never seen fresh seafood that's alive show up in an MRE to the front lines. So I'd say they've. I'd say they've improved their um, logistics or qual uh, quality of uh, people supplying the logistics. How's that? Norway will donate approximately 50 M548 tracked cargo carriers. These are important to get supplies to areas where there are no roads. So you can see this is a tracked vehicle with an open back, like a pickup truck. It looks like a, enough for maybe two, two people in the crew. This is not going to be considered a battle taxi or an ambulance or anything like that. The back end is completely open. I think they can be covered by a tarp as well. Um, but this is basically to instead of using like a Bradley or an M113 or a CB90 or all those things to transport, you know, some equipment or material or whatever, um, you can, supplies, you can now use this. So that frees those up to do other things. In a pinch, for sure. These tracked vehicles, especially in the mud, you need to get some people out. You need to Kazovac them, for sure. Um, you could probably fit three, four guys in the back, easily, easy on stretchers in the back of these things. But uh, really great to see that 50 uh, additional cargo carrying vehicles are being supplied to the Ukrainian armed forces. Well done, Norway. Thank you. Uh, last up, no, not last up, but close to last up. The, the last couple are real shorties and niceies. <clears throat> so... Immediately after his arrival in New York, President, President Zelensky visited, I call this the Atakum's visit, by the way, but uh, President Zelensky visited Ukrainian soldiers who were undergoing re rehabilitation there. He basically went straight from his plane to um, 
this rehab center. Thank you to the team of doctors who are helping our boys recover from injuries. I handed out state awards and heard extremely important words about the indomitability of Ukrainians in our joint victory, said Zelensky. So these are Ukrainian soldiers who have been transferred to the U.S. to a rehab center. And look at how proud they are. gentleman on the back who's either lost his leg or his leg is injured is giving his patches to Zelensky and Zelensky's like no 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 you can keep that one he's like no 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 I want you to have both patches of our unit this is a tradition that everybody gives their patches to to Zelensky they want to know that he's got their unit's pats, patch in his possession He's got lost both arms and a leg. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised to learn that he was uh, an EOD tech that maybe had his arms taken off by a bomb, but who knows. Anyways, beautiful. And I'm a rock. And, okay. Uh, dope. So... This is the last video I want to show you. I want to finish on something um, nice, cute, whatever. And I don't think this is in Ukraine. I don't know where this is, but uh, these are now popping up on my thread. So I thought I'd share. Home sweet home. Here's the chicken roosting on what I thought was going to be eggs. No, they're kittens. <laughs> so I'm assuming their mother was lost. And this chicken said, well, I can keep one. And they are trusting her. They're not leaving. She's pretty protective. So there you go. Anybody can love anybody. <clears throat> Tell someone you love them. Have a great day. Slava Ukraini.